Hey everybody, John Wagnon here with Dev Central. We're coming to you with another Lightboard lesson video. And today we're going to talk about this concept known as perfect forward secrecy. And, uh, and this deals with uh, when you encrypt communications between client and server and uh, the TLS protocol that's used to do that and the handshake that happens and the keys that are exchanged and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's what, this, that's what this whole concept deals with. So to start things out, I'm going to talk about a uh, kind of a use case, if you will, a very common use case of a client that needs to establish a secure communication with a server, a web server. And in order to do that, they go through this TLS handshake. And we've done some videos on that. I'll link to them in the, uh, in the bottom down here. Um, but the, uh, the, the basic concept of what happens when a client communicates with a server is you've got the client over here and you've got the server over here and the client sends uh, what's called a client hello message. That's the beginning of the TLS handshake. And then the server, and, and with that, there's a set of cipher suites that are uh, offered up by the client. The server has a set of cipher suites that are uh, configured on the server, and then it gets to choose which cipher suite is going to be used in this whole communication. Uh, but ultimately, this, the server is going to send back a certificate, and so I'll put a cert right there, certificate, which includes the public key that the server has. Uh, and the server, of course, offers up the public key to everybody because it's public. And then the client then is going to compute, uh, I'm going to call it a pre-master secret. Um, and it, it computes the pre-master secret, and then it sends that pre-master secret back to the server, and then it uses the public key that's included in that certificate. It uses the public key to encrypt the pre-master secret. So when it comes over here, then the server can use uh, its private key. So I'll put the private key to then decrypt that pre-master secret. Because if you guys remember with asymmetric cryptography, uh, the, if you encrypt something with the public key, the only thing that can, can decrypt it is the private key. All right, so now the server has the pre-master secret because it's decrypted that with its private key because it was encrypted with the public key from the client. All right, and so now it has the pre-master secret. Um, and then from the pre-master secret, both the client and the server are going to generate then the master secret or the session key that is used for bulk encryption. So, uh, so I'll just, I'll put, you know, this is the ultimate, not pre-master secret, but the master secret that both of them are ultimately going to come to. And that's going to be used for, I'll put kind of a double arrow, the bulk encryption. And that is used to input to the bulk encryption algorithm, which in many cases is AES. It doesn't have to be, but in many cases it's AES. This concept of, of uh, private and public key typically is used in the concept of the RSA encryption algorithm, where you have a public key and a private key, and that's what RSA is all about. And so this is all well and good, except if this private key is ever compromised, uh, which you would ask yourself, why would it ever be compromised? Well, I don't know, maybe you got some nation state hacking group that really goes after it hard and then they figure out what the private key is. Or maybe there's a court order, you know, you have some kind of subpoena that says, hey, you know, company X, you've got to turn over your private key to whoever. Um, so for any number of reasons, this private key may be compromised. And so the situation could happen that you have some nefarious actor, some hacker bad guy that's, that's uh, collecting all of the communication down here that's encrypted with these secret keys. Um, and, he, and this bad guy stores it maybe on a hard drive or whatever. And he just collects it for years and years and years. And then one day in the future, for whatever reason, he gets the private key from this server. And if he gets the private key, then he can take that pre-master secret and he can decrypt it because that's what the client had. He can decrypt that pre-master secret and then it's fairly trivial at that point to then generate from that pre-master secret the actual secret key that's used in this encryption. And then he can decrypt everything and he can look at all of your communication that you thought was secure. And so people said, hey, let's, uh, let's try to figure out a way around that. And so that's where this concept of perfect forward secrecy comes into play. And perfect forward secrecy tries to get around this, or frankly does get around this, by using some encryption methodologies that are not reliant on the private key of the server. So I'm going to come over here really quick, and I'm going to show you another example of, of what's used in many cases today, where you have a client right here and a server over here. And so the client uh, sends the hello message, just like you normally did. 
So client hello. And then what the server is going to do is the server is going to generate a prime number. So here's a prime number and then also this thing called a modulo. And then the server is going to uh, pick that, frankly, uh, create that and then send that back over to the client. But also as it sends it back over to the client, it's going to, uh, it's going to generate what I'll call this secret, um, this secret number. Uh, that's based, by the way, what I'm describing here is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is really cool. It's, it's based on these complex mathematical properties, uh, but it does not ever rely on the server or the client using the public or private key in order to exchange the, uh, these pre-master secrets and, and ultimately the keys. And so the server can pick a known prime number, a known modulo, and then it, and then it uh, picks a random integer. So I'm going to say random, random integer, integer. And so using the known prime number and the known modulo, and then its chosen secret, I'll call random integer, it, create, it, it calculates a value, and I'll call it the value, I'll call it A. And it sends that over to the client. So it sends the prime number, the modulo, and this calculated value A. Well, the client now has the prime, the modulo. It's going to it's going to pick its own uh, random integer. So I'm going to put random integer over here as well, integer. And using that same prime number, that same modulo, and that calculated value for a, it's going to calculate a value for, uh, and I'll call it b, and it's going to send that value b back over to the server. And this is the this is the key exchange, the server key exchange, and the client key exchange which can be a part of the TLS handshake. It doesn't have to be like, a, like I showed over here, and it depends on what cipher suite you choose. If you, choose, if you don't choose a Diffie-Hellman key exchange part of your cipher suite, then you're not going to have the key exchange part over here. You're going you're to use RSA for that. But if you choose a Diffie-Hellman key exchange uh, cipher suite, then you will have a server key exchange and client key exchange as a part of your TLS handshake. Um, Nonetheless, when, these a, when this value A and B both get uh, sent back and forth, then each one of them can use the associated values to then go, and this is where the Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange mathematics gets like really complicated and really cool actually. Uh, they can both generate the same, I'm going to call it a pre-master master secret. Um, and then I'll just put that over here as well. So a pre-master secret, goodness, pre-master secret. Just like, so ultimately they have arrived at the same thing that the RSA key exchange uh, arrived at as well, but they've arrived there without ever having to know the private key of the server. And, and again, it's based on this complex math of what the Diffie-Hellman key exchange uh, is founded on, and it's really cool stuff. So based on all this, then they can arrive, they can do all the complex math, they arrive at the same pre-master secret, and then the same, the same basic concept uh, happens at that point uh, where they take the pre-master secret and using that, uh, using that information, using those values, then they can then generate the master secret. So I'll put uh, you know, secret down here and secret down here. So this leads to that, this leads to that, and then this now can be used as the secret key again, probably, and I'll just put AES again. I'm choosing AES because it's a really common bulk encryption algorithm. Um, and so you have arrived now at a master secret using a bulk encryption algorithm, but you've arrived there without ever having to know the private key of the server. Such a really cool thing. Um, alrighty, so what this does, and the way that this all ties back now to perfect forward secrecy, is if the private key of the server is ever compromised, if you use this stuff, if you use the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, then it doesn't matter if the private key is ever compromised because when, this, uh, when these random integers, I'll just circle this right here, these random integers are chosen, then these things are just randomly chosen and, and I'll, I'll also introduce another, uh, another word, it's called ephemeral, ephemeral, and what ephemeral means is very short-lived. It doesn't take, you know, it, it's not around for very long kind of thing. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, like a New Year's resolution, you know, for most people. It just doesn't last very long. Um, but nonetheless, ephemeral, the, the basic concept of ephemeral is it just does not last long. So if you pick a Diffie-Hellman ephemeral key exchange uh, for your cipher suite, 
then what's happening is every single time the client establishes a new session with the server, then brand new random integers are chosen, and these are called ephemeral. Uh, this would be an ephemeral key exchange, uh, and that is that, again, the random integers are chosen brand new ones every single time. And so even if you did happen to choose or happen to compromise the random integers that, that, uh, that are used in the creation of all these pre master secrets and secrets and all that, um, even if you were to, to, to grab hold of one of those, if you use ephemeral keys, then you would only have uh, enough information to compromise the communication of that one session between the client and the server. And so the next time it establishes a new session, it's a completely different set of random integers and you would have no idea what they're talking about. Or you would have no idea what the encryption, what the secret would be uh, that, that uh, you know, encrypted all that stuff. So, uh, so anyway, so perfect forward secrecy is not necessarily a checkbox that you normally have or, or that you would have, say, on your big IP or, or otherwise. It is an outcome of choosing a certain type of cipher suite key exchange. So when you choose the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, you ultimately achieve um, the, this idea of forward secrecy. And if you choose Diffie-Hellman ephemeral key exchange, then you achieve the effect of the what we call a perfect forward secrecy uh, because you're going to have brand new random integers every single time. And so, so when you're in your big IP and you're doing your configurations and all that, uh, don't necessarily look for, hey, let me check box the, the perfect forward secrecy check box. Um, what you need to do is you need to choose the right cipher suites that then would provide the effect of perfect forward secrecy. Um, and so I can link to that in the bottom of this video to show you the actual cipher suites. Basically what you need to do is you need to make sure that Diffie-Hellman is chosen as the key exchange mechanism and ultimately Diffie-Hellman ephemeral. So when you're, um, when you're configuring your client SSL profile on your big IP, you need to make sure you choose the right cipher suites that would then achieve the effect of perfect forward secrecy. So hopefully you've learned a couple of things on uh, you know, the, the way that it's done, the way that key exchange is done in some instances, the way that it can be done, and this is by far the, uh, the better choice because it provides more secrecy uh, in the future. So if anyone is ever capturing all your communication, they try to go back and decrypt it later on. If you're doing this stuff where you have a brand new, uh, you know, ephemeral key every single session, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're not going to be able to read all your stuff. So uh, anyway, get out there. Uh, configure that big IP properly. Again, we'll, uh, we'll uh, link to, to different resources in the bottom of this video. That way you can check it all out. So uh, again, hopefully you've learned a couple things here about perfect forward secrecy. Thanks for watching this edition of Lightboard Lesson, and we'll see you guys out there in the community.